Hi, this is James Barris. I hope you find this talk supports you in your practice. If you'd like to support my teaching, you can use the donate button underneath my picture on Dharma Seed to do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. Okay, well, uh, last last two weeks we uh, spent some time with Ajahn Chah two weeks ago, whose main approach is just seeing where you're holding on and letting go, seeing if it's possible just in the moment to let go of whatever it is you're grasping at in a very natural, easy, unforced way, but with great mindfulness. Last week, we uh, spent some time with Mahasi Sayadaw, whose practice is particularly um, uh, focused, utilizes the method of mental noting, where you're naming whatever you're doing, in, out, reaching, touching, picking, like that. How many people, anybody uh, play around with that in their practice this week? Great. Anything to report of note, either in your meditation practice or your daily life practice? Yeah, you're allowed. Why just stand up? Uh-huh. Did he try it or? <laughs> yeah, just name whatever you're doing. Uh, anybody who had their own personal experience with it? Yeah, here, why don't you just do it? Speak right into it. It'll be in a moment. There we go. It has to warm up. Hi. I'm really hung up on language, and so I spent a lot of time trying to name things, and like, I couldn't quite come up with the right name Mm -hmm. (laughs) for what was happening. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Trying to do that, it was like too much, Mm -hmm. too much information. Like, already my mind is so busy, and then now I'm trying to focus it on naming these things. It was very interesting. Uh huh. Okay, thank yeah. you for bringing that up. It's 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 something that comes up for people. You know, my God, you know what? There's so many things happening. What's the right name? And uh, it just gets very busy. If you can do it in a very relaxed way, that's the idea. Sometimes, like in a sensation, as you're as you're feeling the breath and you're feeling it, you might take a moment to say, "What is that sensation? Is it sparkling?" Or or whatever, and once you name it, like in the breath, there's so many different sensations. It's impossible to notice sparkling wave, puff, blah, 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 and one in breath. So you're just going in and covering with all of those, but you're recognizing them. As far as refining, well, what is the sensation? Is it a twisting, burning, burning, tugging, pulling, whatever? When it gets complicated, you just note sensation, sensation, and make it very, very generic and simple. And at times, as you found, the words can get in the way and make it just too busy. At that point, let go of the words. The words are just a, an aid, a tool to direct you to the actual experience. So with all of these, it's not like, oh, now we're going to get the real one. They're all real ones, and you just uh, have them in your toolkit to explore. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, Sunlin Sayadaw. I'll say a little bit about him, and then a bit about his practice, and then we'll do it together. Uh, He was born 1878 in uh, central Burma in a village called Sunlin. So when he became a Sayadaw, Sayadaw is kind of a revered teacher He's Sunlin Sayadaw. Like, you know, if you became a, a master, you might be called Berkeley Master. Like, it's like Sunlin Sayadaw. Um, and he uh, had very 
minimal education. He had some education at a monastery school, very little formal education. He was barely literate. Um, and he took a job at, when he was 15 uh, in an office, as an office boy in some local commissioner's uh, office. Did that, oh, he was married uh, to somebody from his, his village um, as a young man. Then at the age of 30, went, returned back to his village and uh, took up farming. So just uh, lived the farmer's life for, uh, for a while. And the interesting thing happened. He, his farming um, became, uh, very, he became a very prosper, prosperous farmer, even though land around him and his neighbors, they were not so prosperous. He had somehow very good fortune with his crops, which sounds like a really good thing, good karma. Right? Uh, but there's a little twist. Um, he actually, and part of this is during 1919, I guess the epidemic was the flu, it maybe it was the influenza, that was, I think, when it was going around the, the world. But there was this epidemic, and a lot of other people suffered. He and his family didn't suffer. So you think, wow, this guy's really lucky. Except in Burma, they, there's a belief that if your fortunes rapidly rise while everybody around you doesn't, it's a signal that you're going to die. So, there's some good news. And he actually started getting very distraught as his fortunes rose. He asked an astrologer, he went to an astrologer at some point, and uh, this is in 1919, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he asked him to read his chart, and the astrologer said, a two-legged being will soon leave your house. Well, he thought that meant, uh-oh, the jig is up. That's definitely the sign. So he performed this act of charity, which is another part of the belief system, you know, just doing a great act of merit. And he put on this three-day feast, inviting everybody in his village to come and uh, he was going to feed them for three days. And they erected this big pavilion, as they sometimes do in Asia, uh, hoping that that act of merit could perhaps save him. On the third day, somebody came who he'd never known before, uninvited, not, not really somebody from the village. This mill, uh, mill clerk uh, came in, participating in the feast. Maybe he heard there was some good food going around, and he went there and checked it out. I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> that's, that's my little editing uh, on top of it. Uh, and he got into this conversation with, what's his, what was his name? Ukya Din, that was his name. Uh, that was Sunlun's original name, and told him about Vipassana practice, about mindfulness, that you can practice meditation and, um, and become free. Well, something struck a chord in, uh, in Ukya Din's heart and mind, and he was fascinated. He couldn't sleep that night, and he was so... Curious, the next day he found this guy, and he said, and he was a little bit shy about asking. But he said, "Look, I can barely read. I have no knowledge of the scriptures. Can I do this too?" And he was told, "Doesn't matter. This is not about scholarship. This is about practice. You can do it too." So um, Ukyadin began to meditate with great fervor. He, is, he was an intense guy, and he started by feeling the in-breath and out-breath, anapana, at, your, uh, at, the, at the nostrils. He ran into somebody else who said, uh, besides just, just the in-breath and the out-breath, feel the touch point. Feel where the breath is passing. Don't, get, don't follow the breath into your body. Just stay with 
the point where you feel the breath go in and out. And be very, very diligent about that. And it's all about noticing the touch sensation. Besides doing the breath, he then expanded it to wherever he was touching. If his hands touched a knife, you know, it's touching that, feeling that contact. And his walking, he was with every step. Whenever there was contact, which is all the time, if he's not paying attention to the breath, he was paying attention to the touch point. And he really got into it. So much so <clears throat> that um, he got into, he started having lots of lights and all kinds of sensations and because uh, he got very, very concentrated. And it's said that, at least according to the, to his biography, that on one month, uh, he attained the first stage of enlightenment, and then a second month, he attained the second stage of enlightenment, and then in the third month, he, uh, he got to the third stage. And then he asked permission, there's four stages, fully enlightened being is the fourth stage. This is not the usual trajectory of practice. He asked permission of his wife, this is from uh, Living Dharma, um, Jack's book, asked permission of his wife to let him become a monk, and after much resistance, the wife agreed. Actually, I read in another biography on, on the internet where she gave him a really hard time. You know, Will you tend to your farming and the crops, please? And he just was completely one-pointed on practice. And finally, she agreed, and there's a little bit aside. Even then, she asked, him to, oh, she, she asked him to sow a final crop of peas before he left. Ukyaudin set out for the fields, but even as he was broadca broadcasting the seeds, he felt the great urge to renounce the world. Setting his cam cattle free, he put the yoke up against the tree, went to the village monastery, and begged the monk there to accept him as a novice in the order. He, it's kind of like Jack and the Beanstalk, in a bit, you know. He next took himself to the caves nearby and practiced diligently until in October 1920 he attained the final stage of enlightenment, arhatship. And then he became well known uh, among monks and a lot of people came to, to see him. And he actually has, uh, there are a number of Sunlin uh, monasteries uh, in Burma who do this practice that he developed. It is kind of Rambo approach to practice. And I'll share with you a little bit about what they do, and then we'll do just a touch of it. They sit for um, usually two or three hours at a time. The first 45 minutes to an hour, they do this very vigorous, rigorous breathing, which we'll do for maybe five minutes or so. You'll see what it's like in um, much time. Five minutes, seven minutes or so. Then after that, they stop on an in-breath and sit motionless for the next two plus hours. It's a big part of it, sitting motionless. Uh, you can breathe. It's not like you're holding that. <laughs> but you're holding that for, for a while, and you're feeling lots and lots and lots of sensations. Nothing about any concepts. They think, as, as it said, uh, they think that the Sunland teachers say this is the clearest and most direct path to freedom. Ajahn Chah or Buddha Dasa, who we'll do next time, who are just kind of, oh, you know, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, nothing to do, nothing to be, nothing to have. They don't go for that. Uh, this is, they say, it's very slow and indirect. Mahasi Sayadaw and, and other techniques, that's conceptual. This is the direct experience. No mental noting at all. You're just experiencing directly the sensations. I'll read a little bit of, um, of the instructions. Yeah, maybe I'll just see Special emphasis 
on intense effort, concentrating on direct perception of sensations, especially pain, is the key to Sunlin practice. Um, it is strongly go- uh, the use of sensation, especially pain, is what characterizes it. It's strongly goal oriented, directing total effort in each sitting to the development of concentration and insight that will lead to nirvana and liberation. Emphasis on long, motionless sitting. Total effort uh, to overcome pain and distraction is the way of Sunlun. The power of the concentrated heavy breathing and the pain that follows is suitable for overcoming many of the hindrances that normally distract a meditator. No matter how sleepy you feel, a session of hard breathing concentrating only on sensations in the nostrils will wake you right up. Same for a distracted mind. Um, let's see, 93. There's a couple of choice quotes here that grab my attention. Oh, yes. This is a, a Dharma talk from one of the Sunlin teachers. The motto that uh, Sunlin Sayadaw said, be rigorously mindfulness of the awareness of touch. He emphasized rigorousness as an essential element because he understood the yogi. The yogi is much inclined to sit loosely and meditate in a relaxed, leisurely way. He tends to be reflective and considerate. Reflective in the sense of reflecting and thinking about the task to be done rather than doing it. Consider it... <laughs> Consider it in the, in the sense of sympathizing with himself, taking great care to see that he's neither overexerted nor hurt. The yogi has a great love for himself and therefore prefers to let his thoughts run away with him to drift rather than pull himself together. To pull himself together needs exertion and that is anathema to the yogi. That is why when he's told to breathe harder, he is ready to quote chapter and verse to prove that he does not need to exert himself. Many are the occasions in which the yogi indulges in self-deception. Though he should practice intensively, he deceives himself that the goal of liberation can be run in a, can be won in a leisurely manner. Though he should sit still, he deceives himself that a slight shift or movement can do no harm. Perhaps he's right for initial crude moments of the practice, but for the peak in each phase of practice, the smallest wavering of mindfulness can bring down the structure of meditation and the edifice will need to be set up again, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So here's the instructions, and then we'll do so. First, posture. Mm. Assume a medi... Don't worry, you're, we're not going to get Assume a meditative posture which can be, be maintained for some time without change. Not, do not lie in bed nor recline in a chair. Uh, the back should be straight. The arm should be held close against the side of the body. The right fist should be held in the left hand. This is to facilitate the clenching of the fist as the meditator summons his strength to combat unpleasant sensations which may arise later. Ready? Now, I know Jack went to Sunlun uh, uh, practice, and I, another friend, Ralph Steele, went to a Sunlun monastery in the last few years. And I've done some Sunlun. I, I've done it twice for like an hour, 45 minutes or so, and then and, uh, sat for another period after that. And it is powerful. So it might sound, this is really weird, but there's something to it. It's just a different take than... Nothing to do, nothing to be. (laughs) Breathing. Commence by inhaling. It will be noticed that the breath touches the nostril, tip, or upper lip. Be keenly mindful of the touch of breath. With mindfulness vigilantly maintained, breathe strongly, firmly, and rapidly. Strong, hard, and rapid breathing wards off external noise, helps to control the mind, quickly removes the hindrances, rapidly establishes concentration, and enables the meditator to cope with the unpleasant sensations which may arise later. Strong, hard, and rapid breathing will cause inhaled and exhaled breath to touch with increased friction against the tips of the nostril holes, the upper lip, or some other part of the body in that region. Be mindful of that touch. 
Do not let awareness of the breath be of the breath body. Don't follow it in and out of the body. Don't count its entrances and exits. Don't take note of the area of touch or breath, whether it be the nostril tip or the upper lip. Let awareness be only of the sensation of the touch of the breath. Only that. Breathe in air all t- uh, attentively and fully as though water were being drawn into a syringe. Exhale sharply. So you're going like that. My ears just popped over here. Full and hard drawing in of breath helps to establish concentration rapidly and helps the sensations arise. It provides strength in the coming struggle with unpleasant sensations. Fatigue may, fatigue may set in at the early stages of strong, hard, rapid breathing, but the meditator should not stop nor reduce the strength of rapidity of breathing. Don't rest when fatigued, says Sunlin Sayadaw. Um, you, you get the, the drift. Okay, sensation. Okay, so you're doing that, and then when it is about time to stop strong, strong respiration, 50 or 100 strokes of breath should then be made. That's kind of like the cool down. Um, this time, with all the strength at the meditator's command, meanwhile, meanwhile, mindfulness of touch of breath should be relentless. Then respiration should be stopped suddenly on the inhaled breath, and collecting oneself, the whole body should be watched internally. And then the next part, sensation. Respiration should be stopped completely and suddenly on inhaled breath. The body should be stilled, gathered together, and watched rigorously. Sensations of pain, cramp, ache, numbness, or heat, or cold will arise in the body. Be mindful of the most pronounced sensation. Do not let it go. Do not switch the attention to the navel, the solar plexus, nor any other region. It is natural for the most pronounced sensation to demand one's attention. Not, oh yeah, okay. So here's the, uh, here's after we've done Mahasi last, last week. Um, when there arises an ache, it immediately catches hold of the fact of the ache. It does not formulate the concept aching, aching, and then return to the fact of the ache. Therefore, it tells the meditator, of uh, Sunland does, avoid name calling. Do not conceptualize reality. So he's kind of putting it out. This is the real way. Okay. So uh, given that, let's just play around with it. Oh, a couple of other things. No thought of me or my, no reflecting on, oh, look at how things change. Oh, look at how what they're suffering, look at the selflessness of the experience, you're not reflecting at all. Just coming to the sensation. So this is, yes. Uh, I would suggest closed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just try this. First, we'll try a little bit together and see if we get the hang of it. Remember, water drawing like a syringe. And then exhale sharply. All right. Now, I want to warn you, if you feel that something is a little bit off, don't push yourself. We're not in Burma right now. And Yes. Both through the nose. Yeah. And they, he says that if it gets uh, intense, it's easier to follow the exhalation with that sharp exhalation. So... Pay attention to the inhalation, and uh, there's something about equalizing them uh, that sometimes it can get intense because there's one one is sh- is more intense than the other. So you want to just equalize. That will call for a thought, but just uh, you know, do what you need to, and then carry on. It's like that. Ready, team? <laughs> this is, uh, I've done this before, and it's like there's somebody who's coaching you. You know, it's kind of like, you know, 
What's that? Lamaze. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do. <laughs> uh, and you're keeping it up. We won't do it for 45 minutes, obviously. Five minutes is kind of can be kind of neat. And the sensations that follow can also be fun. 45 minutes is not quite the same kind of fun. Uh, and But I, I can recall the, the times that I've done it. You are entering an altered state of consciousness very quickly. And you are just seeing if you can stay with the sensation, no matter what. Wherever your mind goes, just come back to the sensation. So we'll do it if we can for, oh, we'll see. If I start seeing people drop, then I'll know it's time. To, we'll do it for like, say, five or six minutes or so. And you heard him say, if you can do it, if this is not dangerous or you don't feel there's anything off, um, just keep going, okay? And you can go, at, it doesn't have to be, we all have to be in cadence together. You can just go at, at whatever pace works for you. Um, but I'll start out. Keep going. I'm going to just coach you. You might start feeling some some sensations, some strange sensations. or other things, just monitor yourself, but keep going. your attention at the tip, at the touch point. Not, don't follow the breath in through the body. Just notice the touch of that, the sensation as it hits your nostrils or uh, at the outer nostril. Like a saw going back and forth. Just focus on one area and notice that touching point, that touching sensation. Sharp exhale. You might be aware of the sensations. Just stay focused on that point of the breath passing at the nostrils.
Keep it up. You can do it. Unless you're feeling like there's something off about it, keep it up. Okay, get ready for about another 20 or so deep breaths, and then when we say so, we'll stop together. And then on an in-breath, take a deep in-breath and then stop and stay motionless. Notice the sensations. Whatever sensations are here, be with the most pronounced. No thought, no judgment, just be with the sensation directly. When you need to, you can breathe, but try to sit motionless for the next five minutes. Absolutely motionless, no matter what. If that feels like it's possible.
you might not have even wanted to end the sitting. So, um, um, just uh, before we have a, an open discussion or take questions, whatever, uh, just uh, turn to somebody near you and just share what that was, was like. It could be two or, or even three, if you feel like it. Just uh, share what your experience was like, just for a couple of minutes. Okay. And we'll come back as a group. All right, start finishing up. Okay. A lot of energy in the room, huh? (laughs) Um, So let's just uh, take any comments, questions. Uh, You know, I don't have the... I don't know if I'll have the answers to questions, um, but I can try. Like I say, I've only done this a couple of times on, so uh, I can just conjecture. Yeah. And here we go. It's okay. Here, wait, because we'll record it. Here, bring it. And talk right into it. During the second five minutes, I was um, monitoring my stomach, and I wanted to make sure my stomach wasn't moving. Is that part of the process? I guess so. <laughs> You're just paying attention to wherever the sensations were. That's all. You just, you work hard the first part, and then you don't even think about figuring anything out. You're just wherever you are. You're just wherever your sensations Do you hold your breath? Are. You mean the second part? Yeah. Um, I, I did. I do. Because it's just, 
it's not I like I felt some heart throbs during breath. that time. What's that? I felt some like heart throbs. Yeah, it's not like you're trying to hold. It's just kind of like you feel like holding your. I felt like holding my breath. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Like speak uh, right into it. Put it okay. right next to your lips. Uh, we noticed that it um, was like holotropic breath work, mm-hmm. like holotropic breathing. Um, the whole rebirthing process. Mm-hmm. So it, th- I, I thought it was fabulous. I thought it was absolutely amazing. And in the second five minutes, um, I don't think I've ever been so still in my life. I mean, that was still. I did not want to come out of it. Mm-hmm. And I felt really expansive and very free. Mm-hmm. How many people had similar response? Yeah, stillness. Oh, cool. Who wants to move? Yeah, uh, it was another hand out here, over there. Well, I've never done anything like this before, and I'm still feeling sensation in my feet. Um, I don't think I could have gone much longer with the breath. I, I, it was kind of like exercise for me. I was like, you know, I'm on the stationary bike. Okay, five more minutes. We can do this. Mm-hmm. We can do this. We can do it. Yeah. And I, I felt that the stillness as well, and just it was. I got high. It was yeah. great high. Yeah. <laughs> Psychedelic dharma, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, pass it over here. Raise your hand. Sharon. Raise your hand. Uh, I'm just wondering if one way to keep doing it is to, like, just increase time. You know, like you start out five minutes today. Is, or do, is that something that people do? If five minutes seems like a long time right now, just keep trying that, and then gradually. I mean, you could. I, I like I say, I'm not. Oh. I'm not the Berkeley master on this. Uh-huh. Uh, Forty-five minutes just seems not they, doable. When you go there, they say you can do it, and they keep on. First time, just first time. You're you're just doing it because you're doing it with a with a, a hundred or, or a couple of hundred oh, people. They're all doing it together, right? What's that? Well, you're breathing, you're all doing the, the breathing part and then the stillness part together. Probably different, you, you know, different cadences. Right? But, but you could try it. I mean, actually, one thing that I, uh, you might extrapolate from this, when I'm sleepy, one of the main things that I use for... is deep breathing. Uh, not, I, I don't go like, like this, but what I do do is go and hold it as long as I can, and then exhale and hold it out as long as I can. I do that for a few minutes, and you do wake up, and you maybe get a sense of it's, using it's that. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, right over here, I'm Tara, hi. And then... I started to feel my lips tingling, mm-hmm. and I was afraid I was going to faint, actually. Uh-huh. And I was getting a side ache, and maybe I'm a wimp. But um, <laughs> So then I tried to slow it down, but that felt like kind of beside yeah. the point. So. No, you know, we're, we're here just playing around with it. Yeah. If you're in Burma, they say, keep on going. Pain, no problem. You know, fatigue, uh, no problem. You keep on going, and you know I don't know if they have have infirmaries nearby or uh, whatever. But their their big thing is, uh, I just read a few passages, of, uh, but there's throughout the whole chapter there's overcoming the pain, not letting the mind get in the way. Um, I wouldn't try that here. You know I'll have a little disclaimer, just to do this at your own risk, and this is not. Uh, you know, what do they call it, uh, jackass dharma, you know, the, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, do, uh, just take care of yourself, and <laughs> that's it, and you do get, there's tingling, there's, uh, like you were saying about feet, a lot of times you, you cramp up, there's, if you've ever done any holotropic breath work, uh, that's another 
you know, that, that's fabulous. That's, if you've ever done Stan Groff stuff, that I've done a few times, a number of times, but on the sitting up in a different posture is just a couple of times like this. Rebirthing, that used to, uh, I went, any, anybody do rebirthing? That was a very powerful process. Uh, like this, you go uh, through a, a number of sessions of very intense uh, breath work, and you go into a different state. So it's just playing around with that. Is it uh, here, one one more, and then you had your hand up, and then this is really quick. Real I, I sense the mark of this teacher on uh, SN Goenka. Say again. I, I'm I'm feeling the mark of this teacher on SN Goenka. Uh, is there any no no connection at all? Uh, in this book, we will get to Goenka's teacher Uba Ken, which is a whole that's a that's a very different. Uh, technique, but they're certainly noticing body sensations. Yeah, and and some strictness. Yeah, and then in the back uh, right there. Oh, I, I should. Too bad I, I forgot to put it out at the uh, at the break. But you can have a a look at Sunlun. He's a fun guy. Uh, <laughs> he's. Uh, you, you can come up here afterwards if you want to l- look at him, but. Um, don't mess with someone. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's one. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick comment. If there's anyone that's interested in sort of exploring uh, this method more closely, there's something really similar called the Art of Living uh, that teaches courses in, in the Bay Area. And they use a really similar breath technique. It starts out with some deep breathing, and then you go into the really rapid breathing, and then meditation afterwards. And some people may have been exposed to that before, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Okay, so I don't know how much there can be an application of this in your daily life uh, this week, like with the other two. But a couple of things that do come to mind that you might, uh, yeah, just keep in mind. One, um, there's a fearlessness to this. He, the, the, the word courage comes up again and again in the chapter. Um, there's also um, a kind of persistence. Uh, and one practice that you can play around with that is wh- when you're doing a Sunlun, that you're in a Sunlun monastery, besides the periods of intense breathing, every other moment what you're doing is what Sunlun did, did in, uh, in his early practice, just noticing touching anything. Noticing your hands touching, your feet touching, contact. That in itself is a very powerful concentrating focus uh, that you can take with you wherever you go. Uh, and if, you're, if you want to experiment in your sitting with it and do some deep breathing at the beginning, particularly if you say, gosh, I always fall asleep, do like a couple of minutes of this and notice what your meditation is like. Not that you're trying to get high, but that you do bring a lot of wakefulness, and it is it is easy to notice the sensations. Uh, like I say, for a few minutes, it's actually kind of fun. Um, it's the 45 minutes and, the, the, and two hours afterwards that is, uh, is less fun. But you can have fun with it. So um, uh, that's Sunlin. Next time, we're going to do just the complete opposite approach to practice, uh, which is um, Ajahn Buddhadasa. And one of the things that I love about this, about Jack's book, and about uh, just seeing all these different masters, is, as I said earlier, there's no one right way. So you find the way that works for you. Okay, so we'll have a quick dedication of marriage. Uh, feel your aliveness, feel your heart center, and breathe in a, a sense of benevolence from life around you. Let it fill your whole being. Every cell of your being is alive. As you breathe out, radiate that out. 
your aliveness. And then wish yourself well. May I have happiness and peace in my life. May I share my love well and wake up to my true nature. And extending that to all beings everywhere, may all be happy, may all be peaceful. May all know the blessings in their life as we approach Thanksgiving. May we have gratitude for even, even being alive. And may we see through our fears and share our love. And may our coming together be of benefit to all beings everywhere. May all beings be happy. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.